Hello Bartonella buddies! I want to apologize for a grave oversight I made in my previous video. I forgot to put Piper in it! What was I thinking? Mwah. This video is going to build on my previous video on titers. Remember how in my previous video I said that Lyme Literate Medical Doctors, or LLMDs, are the doctors best suited at this time to treating Bartonellosis? Well, I still stand by that, but I want to make the switch over to calling them Bartonella Literate Medical Doctors, or BLMDs. The reason for this is manyfold. One is that Lyme disease and Bartonellosis are caused by two different bacteria and can cause severe disease manifestations independent of each other. Also, for some people, Bartonellosis is the primary infection and Lyme is the co-infection. Moreover, not all Lyme literate medical doctors are Bartonella literate and this honestly alarms me. I read about patients all the time using the wrong antibiotics for the wrong duration at the wrong dosage at the direction of their Lyme literate Bartonella illiterate medical doctors. I see these doctors using the wrong tests and interpreting tests incorrectly. If Bartonella is a big issue for you or you at least think it is, you need to make sure that your LLMD is also a BLMD. I'm really hoping that BLMD is an an acronym for something weird or gross or sexual or weird gross and sexual. If you have Bartonellosis and you're not infected with Borrelia, I would encourage you to not say that you have Lyme disease. Once my friend told his coworker that I have Lyme disease and I was like, no dude, how is Bartonella ever going to get the recognition it deserves if you keep calling it Lyme disease? Hence why I'm Bartonella babe and not Lyme lady. So let's go back to Galaxy's handy dandy sheet that I'm gonna put in the video description box as link number one. We already know that IFA will confirm your exposure to Bartonella if your ePCR is negative. Your first IFA test will provide baseline antibody titers for later evaluation of antibody response. Galaxy recommends retesting the serology during treatment to monitor for seroconversion or an increase in titers to confirm treatment response. Seroconversion describes the change from being seronegative to seropositive on an antibody test. The extent of my biology ended at Biology 101 in my freshman year of college, so as I have been reading a lot about Bartonella over this past year, I have been having to look up what so many words mean, like hemangiosarcoma, uveitis, macrophage. But then several months ago, my mom, who was a psych and bio major, told me that itis is the suffix for inflammation, and it all clicked that biology has these root words, and if I just memorize what the root words mean, then I don't have to look up every single little thing. And I was like, you couldn't have taught me that 20 years ago? Oh, like when you were six? Yeah. Uh, how about 10 years ago? Okay. So in case you already didn't know this, the zero part of the word refers to blood serum and the converts part of the word refers to going from negative to positive. If a person zero converts, they have gone from having undetectable antibodies in one blood draw to having detectable antibodies in the next blood draw. Galaxy's handy dandy sheet states that a patient may develop positive antibody titers during antibiotic therapy if they were previously negative, aka zero conversion. And there are two possibilities for why this happens. The first possibility is that as a patient goes through antibiotic therapy, their immune system recovers and begins to make antibodies over weeks or months. The second possibility is that during antibiotic antibiotic therapy, dead bacteria may be pushed out of the cells and into the bloodstream, and the immune system is tipped off to the dead bacteria and begins to make antibodies. Galaxy writes, and this is important, during treatment, increasing or persistent antibody titers do not indicate active or persistent infection. Similarly, after treatment, antibodies may decline gradually or persist, but the persistence of antibodies does not necessarily mean persistence of infection. Basically, you cannot make decisions on treatment around antibodies alone, so hopefully your doctor isn't doing this. Treatment decisions are best made using all laboratory and clinical information, not just antibody titers. Now let me back this up with some research. There isn't a whole lot of research about how titers persist or decline in Bartonella infections. In the scientific literature, this is referred to as antibody kinetics or antibody decay. I like to tell you what the proper terms are for scientific phenomena in case you want to research it yourself because let me tell you, it is so difficult to do research when you don't even know the proper key terms to use. Antibodies decreasing over time. Antibodies staying the same. Antibodies going down. One of the best studies I could find on antibody kinetics was a long-term serological follow-up on patients with cat scratch disease published in Clinical Infectious Diseases, which is the IDSA's journal, 
and I'll put this as link number two. The authors studied 98 patients with acute cat scratch disease, and what they found was that most people's antibody titers decline over time, and that 75% of patients are seronegative within a year of the disease onset, but 25% of patients still tested positive on IgG more than a year after the onset of cat scratch disease, and some of them two years after the onset. The authors found no relationship between antibody kinetics, duration of illness, or disease manifestation. What this means is that serology tests for Bartonella are not useful tools for monitoring disease course or resolution. Now I wonder, given what researchers have discovered recently about chronic disease manifestations of Bartonellosis, if the persisting titers in 25% of those patients is in part due to persistent infection. To know that, we would need more research. Does anybody out there want to fund this? Anybody? Another important note is that higher titers do not necessarily mean that you are more symptomatic. Don't fall into this trap! I remember getting back my IFA panel and seeing that my titers were 1 to 128 and feeling validation that, well, at least my titers aren't 1 to 64. IFA is an imperfect testing method, so if it cannot definitively tell you whether or not you have an active infection, it certainly cannot tell you how sick you are. You must track your progress with how you feel with your doctor's input. Don't get caught up in the whole game of my titer's bigger than your titer. Because remember, it's not the size of the titer that counts, it's how you use those titers. See what I did there? Some great examples of this point come from the literature on ocular bartonellosis. What I love about ocular bartonellosis, which is a weird thing to say, so stay with me, is that these symptoms are often visible to the doctor and therefore can't be written off as psychosomatic. They're also often serious and therefore taken seriously. Let me tell you about a little boy named well, obviously they don't name him in this case report because that would be unethical, so let's call him Bart. I'll put this case report as link number three. Bart was just six years old when he developed blurry vision and his visual acuity in his left eye was only at the count fingers level. An eye exam found serious abnormalities, including optic disc edema, an macular star, and an inflammatory lesion. You can see the macular star right here. Is my fingernail dirty? No. His serology results were negative on both IgM and IgG, but his doctors started him on azithromycin and rifampin anyway, and two weeks later, his titers went to 1 to 1024. Whoa! Antibiotic therapy improved his vision and both the swelling and lesion reduced. Now let me tell you about another story that was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases about a nine-year-old girl. Let's call her Ella. Ella presented with iridocyclitis, which is also called anterior uveitis, and involves inflammation of the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. She had no systemic symptoms, and then she developed neuroretinitis. At this point, she was tested with a Bartonella IFA, and her titers were 1 to 128, and this was 13 months after the onset of disease. The report literally says, and I don't know if this is like a language barrier or translation issue or what, but this made me laugh, um, the patient's medical history was unremarkable. She denied having pets, but admitted having frequent contact with horses. And then it says, the patient was then carefully questioned about animal contacts. She confessed close contact with cats. Fess up, little girl. Have you been playing with cats? No, no, I wouldn't do that. Meh, see, I told you she was a liar. Fine, it was me, but Jessica made me do it. Little Ella began antibiotic therapy, her neuroretinitis resolved, and she remained healthy in a six-year follow-up, and her antibodies declined to undetectable levels. So what we've learned from Bart and Ella, see what I did there, is that people with serious disease manifestations of Bartonellosis can have low titers, and people with low titers can experience an increase in titers after starting antibiotic therapy, and that titers can't tell you how sick you are, nor can they tell you about disease course. And Bart and Ella are only two case reports out of many in the literature of people with severe manifestations of Bartonellosis with low or no titers. And there have been case reports of people bacteremic with Bartonella with severe psychiatric Pediatric, rheumatological, neurological, ocular, hepatic, and general symptoms who have no titers, low titers, and or seroconvert after starting antibiotic therapy. Most of these studies have been conducted by Dr. Breitschwer and his colleagues, and I'll put a link to a few of these in the video description box. These case studies are a great start, but what is sorely needed are studies that follow symptomatic Bartonellosis patients through treatment. These types of studies have not yet been done, and they're expensive. Does anybody out there want to fund this? 
Anybody? From there, researchers can hopefully build the kind of evidence that is needed to change what is taught to new doctors and to send updated information through continuing education channels for physicians. Only then will infectious disease doctors and other mainstream doctors become more Bartonella literate. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet and make sure to share this video so you can help me go viral. Or should I say, bacterial. See what I did there? Your first IFA will also provide baseline antibody, 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 anybody out there? <laughs> <laughs> tests are not useful tools for monitoring, 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 monotoring, <laughs> touring by oneself.